so so welcome everyone uh, for for this last session uh, uh, it's an honor to uh, be able to introduce uh, my friend uh, Jeffrey O'Brien uh, anyone who knows Jeff or even looks has looked at his CV uh, will realize that there's just one way you can describe him uh, the un un only phrase that you can use uh, to describe Jeff is a phrase we used to use 50 years ago, and the phrase is a man of letters. That's what he is, a man of letters. Um, he is professionally uh, one of the most distinguished book editors in the United States. He retired as the, the editor-in-chief of the Library of America. Besides that, he is also a very distinguished prize-winning poet. Um, he's written several... Uh, uh, prose works, non-fictional, full-length books, and he his reviews of of books and newspaper uh, and books and movies have appeared everywhere. The New York Times, uh, uh, the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, you name it. Uh, you know, just a sample of four of his books will give you some sense. He's written many more. I'm just reading out the titles of. Four, which will give you a sense of the range of his interests. So, uh, it's one is called the Hard Boiled America, Lurid Paperbacks and Masters of the Noir, The Phantom Empire, which is a book about movies, The Browser's Ecstasy, a meditation on reading, uh, Sonata for the Jukebox, an autobiography of the years. So, so there's movies, uh, there's there are books, lit the, the literary itself, there's sound. Now, uh, Jeff is going to do something uh, which I think only he could have managed. Uh, he's, he's going to read out really what is a long poem, uh, but it addresses everything that's central to the symposium, mm, reading, writing, telling stories. Uh, as always, as in everything that he writes, Jeff is uncompromisingly direct, uncompromisingly accessible. But if you listen carefully, before you know it, you'll be drawn into uh, the deepest complexities of listening and telling stories. So thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Thank you so much, Sambuda, and uh, thank you, Amit, for inviting me and, and uh, getting to share this experience with, with all the other participants. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to read uh, a piece called A Story in Memory of John Ashbery, and I, I hasten to say that this is not a, a, a tribute to, to Ashbery or a commentary on his work. Uh, Although uh, I have, like so many others, I, I feel I've been uh, profoundly I influenced by that work and uh, throughout, uh, uh, really throughout throughout my uh, adult life as a as a reader, um, it's it's simply that um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about John since uh, since he died uh, last summer and. Um, while I was uh, in the early stages of, of composing this, I, I randomly opened a volume of his collected poems and came upon a passage that uh, seemed absolutely appropriate. I, you know, which I'm quoting completely out of context, but then that's true of anything one would quote from Ashbery, that to, to wrench it uh, out of place, uh, if you look at what preceded it and what followed, then uh, the impression is very different, but in, in any, this is like taking one little thing out of the uh, the ongoing current. But uh, this is from uh, the, the very long poem Litany, which actually is two very long poems that run concurrently side by side. But um, he writes. All life is as a tale told to one in a dream, in tones never totally audible or understandable, and one wakes wishing to hear more. I don't remember where I heard this story. After the cessation of hostilities in the Second World War, an American soldier waiting with so many others to go home sat cross-legged on the hot deck of a troop ship, 
reading a paper-bound mystery novel. It might have been the camera clue or the fatal kiss or the x-ray murders. And as he came to the end of every second page, he tore that leaf from the book and passed it to the soldier on his left. Each leaf, in turn, passed thus from hand to hand around the deck until the whole book was read by hundreds of soldiers with nothing else to do but measure the time as it leaked away so that the cheap little paperback, it might have been Reno Rendezvous or Holiday Homicide or The Doctor Died at Dusk, acquired precious value as one soldier at a time found a temporary home in some random wad of narrative padding or incidental description, some flirty come on or slangy comeback, freezing it in place as if by the hypnotic ray in a comic book. Even as the soldier on his left nudged him to read faster, the way, after all, the author must have intended, since mysteries are designed to make time pass as quickly and imperceptibly as possible, to obliterate time and replace it with what is experienced as endless and endlessly pleasurable, even while, despite the impulse to slow down and savor the lovely stillness of an immobilized sentence, the soldier felt driven to get to the end of it, and if the light held, the last reader on deck would have been left with a now useless pile of unbound pages to be tossed away without thought, just as the details of the story itself. It might have been The Fall Guy or Four Frightened Women or Weekend with Death were quickly forgotten by each of the soldiers who had clung to those words as if to the side of a life raft but afterwards didn't even need to make an effort not to forget what was already being erased. In the diminishing light, the elements of the story popped and went out. It could have been the one about the missing will or the missing person, the blackmailed movie star, the body in the locked room, the wronged convict looking for payback from the man who sent him up, the voice rasping threats in the dark after midnight, the rattling of the bolted storm window, the redhead with a yen for trombone players, the tennis pro hiding more than one disgraceful secret, the scotch and soda that didn't taste quite right, what the hat check girl from Club Esquire whispered to the owner's bull-necked chauffeur, the fallen hairnet, the half-smoked cigarette, the galoshes still dry after the rainstorm, the bent key slipped into the green handbag, the silk nightgown tossed in the hamper the way no woman ever would, but the killer didn't know that. And by then the exhausted soldier has dropped into a place where not even a scotch and soda can help him keep the telltale trace from melting in his hands, while the mind struggles to reassemble a story with the same name but a different plot, and by now even the name has changed. Maybe it has become ghost of the shower handle or green horses or the tangled beans but it hits a skid from the get-go spins out into a different century with freakish weather where a body with anomalous biological traits inhabits a zone of methane baths in swift ely leaps transmuting the story of anybody to the story of nobody or more strictly no body the dream becoming a commemorative album on the death of the dreamer just as he crashes into the brittle wall of light, coughing and flicking shards away, and wondering whether dreams are failed attempts at, attempts at storytelling, what with their all too familiar technique of digression within digression, yanking always further from a main thread not to be found again, lost beyond naming, or, on the other hand, our story's inadequate attempts to approximate the dream experience, imposing a wide-awake logic that will always remain alien to what it most wanted to capture. The dreams of the dead have left no trace, but how their stories have piled up, stories of legacies and massacres and rudely interrupted house calls. It might have been the tale of the mistaken twins or the chastised wife or the fate of the orphan, Judges compiling death sentences for a secret court, rustled cattle, talking fish, luminescent blossoms, nothing finally but ordinances and omens, vows and curses, challenges and predictions, messages carried by wind across water to the far shore where they are broadcast like thunder, louder than any sound in any dream, 
the dream in a story about a dream being more elegant than any ever actually dreamt. The twin dreams, for example, in the Arabian Nights tale of the impoverished Baghdad merchant to whom in sleep a messenger appeared saying, go to Cairo to find a great treasure, and who, arriving without resources, fell asleep in a mosque where a robbery took place, and being mistaken for a robber, was beaten and abused until the police chief asked him why he came to Cairo, and he related his dream, and the police chief, uproariously amused by the gullibility of anyone who would put faith in a dream, told him how he once had more or less the same dream, instructing him urgently to go to Baghdad, to a house described in meticulous detail, which the merchant silently recognized as being none other than his own, and on returning to his homeland, obeyed the instruction to excavate the fountain at the end of the garden, thereby uncovering the predicament treasure, no story could be neater. Its crisscross pattern even cancels itself out, leaving no mess behind, as if it were literally the story to end all stories, as if finally there had been enough stories, except that this evidently cannot be the case, since when that moment threatens to arrive, it only generates a further story, a story about precisely the end of all stories, and that turns out to be merely the overture to the multi-volume saga, The End of All Things, that will generate spin-offs and prequels and heavily promoted follow-ups, of which Part 12, Beyond Nothing, will serve as teaser for My End is My Beginning. <laughs> this had been going on longer than anyone was in a position to remember. There was not even a name for the tribe of humans who over a period of 17,000 years inhabited continuously a cave 50 feet wide, 500 feet long. Yet you might be permitted to imagine that in all that time nobody dropped the ball as they practiced in the dark, rearranging plot points, deleting kinks and dead spots along the way like a story conference lasting millennia, while the elders muttered, same old, same old, get me rewrite. And when, having emerged to the light, they invented theater, the principals went into their dance dressed up as lovers who hyperbolize and are forgiven, as lovers who are not forgiven and are slaughtered, as lecherous servants who always in some sideways fashion speak truth, skin flints who rage and are mocked, bandits who triumph through disguise, brothel keepers who smuggle messages, clowns who stagger through alleyways, knocking over buckets and fruit stands, householders who tremble for fear of thieves, Girls too beautiful to be hidden, warriors turned monstrous from lust, crones who explicate lost bloodlines, a procession of stick figures and their living shadows, each both itself and the opposite of the other, unsolvable mixtures, ghosts who sing, animals who prophesy, chasms that open in the ground to show where the wealth was hidden long before the story began, just so there would be something or other to restore millennia of disconnected anecdotes like my uncle told about a drunken brawl at Coney Island or a three-day blizzard or a school chum dying of sepsis from a dirty jackknife, figments of a gone world for which the story is no substitute. The story is nothing or not more than the length of thick celluloid by which a professional burglar pries his way into the closet where the stash is, not more than the weather they moved around in all the while they were telling it, not more than what hangs on it, props, perfumes, back talk, smoke, the crinkling sound from the adjacent room, reachable by no other method, and not even then, as the child found, who, trying to decide which classic comic to read when he had read them all, hoping to find one that would still, still and always, seem new, even after it was more familiar than his hand turning the pages. It might have been Lorna Doone, or The Talisman, or Tom Brown's School Days. Told himself, I want a story that is not like a trap, as he started to fear that every story is a trap that lures past the greenery of the entryway into aisles ever narrowing, whether of barracks or churchyard or schoolroom, without hope of a reverse maneuver, and so went poking along the seams of the stories for the empty space, the green and dripping glistening light of the place where the story stands still, Deerslayer's glimmer glass or the endless Siberia of Michael Strogoff, the zone of unending interlude where the travelers have lunch and savor guitar music, and because the story has stopped, they never in the end resume their journey and consequently are spared the drought-ridden badlands. 
plague, slag heaps, corrupt marauders, tax collectors, torturers, slave drivers, blighted orphanages, airless chapels, the confusions and betrayals waiting for all who managed to reach the city. I don't remember where I heard that story, and certainly it has changed beyond recognition. I remember hearing about a person who sat down once a year to write down the details of the particularly disturbing incident that had haunted a lifetime, choosing to write them down without ever consulting the earlier drafts, and at the end of many decades laid them side by side to find a suite of unrecognizably different stories, nothing remaining but arbitrary narratives so blatantly concocted as to be beyond belief yet no less true, since there they are. They never go away. By their very survival, they confirm there are no untrue stories. There is nothing but truth. It occupies every point of space, seals the exits. The wallpaper is made of it. The accumulation of foxed and partly shredded childhood storybooks is made of it. The orange sun going down out on the street is made of it. Even for the bystander perched outside it, the outsideness is made of it. What doesn't fit into it is tangled in the main works. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, as my uncle would have said, even as the story was being ironed out, the thing that actually happened went off on its own tangent. It did happen. It did. There was a sun in the street, but once only such being the monstrous condition imposed on the living who find relief only in the story that can be taken as needed, even though each telling alters it. Yet after all, the freedom to alter it is what makes it a story. It wouldn't amount to much without the malleability that comes close to the heart of ecstatic delight, while the event, the jackknife, or the brutal happening at Coney Island stays locked up in its truth, warehouse beyond access. It would not be truth if it were not inaccessible. If they could touch it, they would change it. They do change it, and it is no more, and spend the remainder of their time wondering where it went, that incident which was purity itself, and since purity is beyond them, it bedevils them until they make or stumble upon a story to be a stand-in, like a puppet or a candle, a splash of indigo, a stain, a mere splinter, a signal going off in the air, a signal going off the air, you want to hear it. You're afraid to hear it. You're tired of hearing it. You tell it to yourself. You imagine others telling it to themselves. You want to hear it again over and over. You've never heard it. It has been deliberately kept from you. You would pay to hear it. You wish you hadn't heard it. You would pay to forget it. You heard it, but you can't remember it. No one ever heard it. It has never been told. It tells itself. It will be telling itself with no one left to hear. Wow. So, so uh, you know, I think the best thing to do is to, to uh, you know, open it for questions and, and I'll say I, a few things. I, yeah. I hope I can answer them. But I'm sure, uh, sure you can. <laughs> well, I'm not against storytelling. I mean, I felt, when I came here, I felt I was a little bit flying under false colors, because how could I be against storytelling? I've spent my life uh, compulsively absorbing stories from multiple sources uh, and continue to do so. I mean, if there's a, a late 40s melodrama that I've never seen, I, I need to take in that variation on some old plot. So, no, I'm not at all against storytelling. It's just that I, I lack the ability to actually tell a story without uh, kind of doing this kind of thing with it. Um, but you brought what you call narrative padding, all of that, and you could see through all the tropes that you use, the pieces and the tropes. Uh, Jeffrey, you packed in so much in that story, and as a kind of tribute to Ashbury, we can't really let you go. Uh, question because okay. you have woven so much it's it's a tapestry that you have really it's conjured up so many uh, visions I mean and you moved from things and so on uh, that sometimes I wonder whether we heard you whether we heard you mm -hmm. properly or not did we hear or did we not and we, I, and this will keep playing in our minds mm -hmm. 
and uh, what to ask, what to drive in the traffic in the evening. Uh, I just wanted to know whether this was ever published. No, and, no, I, uh, I, I, I wrote it for here. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes as a tribute. Yeah. Did you get a chance to uh, read it at his uh, eulogy, as a eulogy, or at his uh, memorial, at his meeting, or something mm. like that? Did you manage to? Uh, well, no, this is the first time I've read it. First I mean, time? Yeah. Wow, yeah. we are touched. Thank yeah. you. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, oh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This was uh, so fascinating, uh, really. I, mean, the, I, I seem to gather a sort of a relation between dream and storytelling listening to this. and seems like something like there's a relationship of mutual excess, that somehow dreams exceed storytelling, but storytellings also exceed dreams, and they can't quite grasp each other. And that, uh, I, I, I wanted you to say a little more about this, because dreams have such a unique artistic status, and yet you seem to be constructing some sort of a story about the relationship between dreams Well, and yeah, no, what you said is exactly, I mean, I, I, I'm totally fascinated by that relationship because uh, certainly it, I mean it seems like there's a very direct relationship between the, the invention of stories and, and uh, the, the experience of dreaming but at the same time th they are very different um, and um, dreaming well you know except perhaps for certain extremely gifted individuals uh for the most part we, you know we don't remember what we dream we don't we what we remember is a partial reconstruction and already a distortion of just the most superficial layers of, of an experience that presumably uh you know is mostly underwater um uh, i mean i say that i mean clearly there there <laughs> There are everyone's experience of dreaming is different, and, and there are individuals who uh, have cultivated or claim to be able to cultivate a much more total recall of, of their dream experience, and, and clearly also that is something that varies f over time in any individual, uh, and, and the, the, the density of dream recollection and the quality of dream recollection changes in, in the course of a lifetime, uh, and it's just in relation to, you know, what, what one is experiencing physically and, and in every respect. But, um, but then stories, yeah, I mean, even when they precisely attempt to replicate the dream experience, uh, I'm, I think are inadequate to it, but, you know, by compensation almost, they, they create structures that are far more mm -hmm. logical and consistent mm -hmm. than, than any dream. Mm -hmm. uh, so even the most fantastic uh, literature is 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 infinitely more uh, cut and dried and logical than than what the mind produces spontaneously, you know, in, in the course of a night's sleep. So, uh. so if I might just amplify the question that Shoykot asked, uh, because you, you know you're looking at dreams uh, in these few um, packed words. Uh, uh, as both uh, things uh, that, um, is, how should one say uh, it, I mean, you could call it stimulate or um, uh, provoke endless deflections. Uh, and in that sense, uh, 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 you know, retard uh, uh, the, the m movement of events uh, towards the denoma that is uh, the end of a story, but uh, uh, on the other hand, I mean, probably the greatest story about stories is is a series of of digressions. I'm thinking of Don Don Quixote. Uh, on the other hand, uh, dreams. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, the wide uh, wake awake logic is clearly not something that's going to produce the story. And, and, and somewhere the story is between those two things. I mean, on the one hand, the incessant stimulation of dreams, uh, and on the other hand, mm, mm, some way uh, of preventing it from running away completely, uh, a, a sort of thing without a denoma. Well, you know, as I said, I mean, it's, it's absurd to try to generalize about the dream experience, uh, you know. Uh, there's absolutely no way of knowing 
you know how that differs for every individual, but um, but I do think yeah that that quality of of deferred the deferred satisfaction, the deferred resolution, the the endless attempt to find something that in fact gets farther and farther away, and 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 it, while the dreamer gets lost in new avenues that open up that are entirely unrelated to uh, what was going on before. Um, you know, is really connected to the kinds of stories that are, you know, whether they're mysteries or whether they're episodes of the Arabian Nights that involve the the search for some very elusive target or, or the solution to some extremely complex mystery. Except in in literature, those things are generally resolved and usually resolved quite disappointingly. I mean, mm. I mean, certainly, you know, most crime fiction is very, very rare that the solution to a mystery comes anywhere near the you know the the qualities of the mystery itself I mean, um. sure. uh, uh, and then uh, Tarun, Tarun has something to say. Uh, suppose one, one of the uh, sort of basic problems uh, that, that I have with uh, with the statement about stories when, when you know stories are being mentioned mm -hmm. I heard a story, stories are this, stories are that, mm. is um, not, not quite knowing how, uh, how we recognize a story w when we encounter one. I mean, how do we know something is a story is, is not entirely clear to me, just is, I, I, in the sense that when creative writing students say or talk about character, or you, mm. have, a, you have a class on character and, and uh, you have no idea what character is. You know, mm. certainly character is not um, a, a kind of agglomeration of characteristics. Mm. Uh, nor, is, nor is character a, a physical presence with an interior life. So you cannot, you cannot arrive at character by, um, by adding, up, adding up these things. I mean, you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot describe a person and the way they look and then give them mind and emotions and come Mm. arrive at character. So the moment you talk about writing about character, you're stumped because you don't know what character is. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's one of those things you are flummoxed by as a category, but which is constantly in use, and which is mm. supposed to know exactly what you mean by when you refer to it. And I think story is a bit like that. One has no idea what it is, uh, but we are using the word all the time. How do we know what a story is? How do we recognize it? I, I don't know. It just seems to me that, uh, well, for one thing, that story precedes character as a, I mean, just historically. And, and uh, you know, I'm assuming that, again, I mean, since we can't know what was related, you know, in, in the millennia of, of but... Uh, but certainly just looking at, 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 at literary um, history, uh, character seems to be a rather late development and, and a, uh, a, a, a definite turn, you know, and, and not just in one literature, but many different literatures. Uh, after, I suppose, you know, the story, pure story, you know, was feeling somewhat exhausted, so that uh, um, because you know, again, story just in its kind of primeval skeletal form, it kind of takes character for granted. I, I think you know, I mean, it, it, character is something that can be identified by like one trait or or one gesture, one action, and then okay, that's that's who that person is. They're the person who did that or said that. And, uh, you know, whether it's in, you know, a saga or an episode of, of the Old Testament or, uh, you know, a Sumerian uh, text, you know, um, uh, I mean, characters have, have attributes which may be multiple and may be contradictory. But you know that's that's a, a different kind of thing. I mean, it's like you have a a kind of just primordial figure, 
and then on that you can drape many many different things i mean like an ancient god you know who who has you know fantastically contradictory uh uh identities that all coexist and you know um I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know if that answers your question or just veers off in a in a different direction. But uh, I don't have something to ask. Thank you for that. Uh, somehow I was uh, reminded of uh, Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five while you were reading the poem, mm. and especially this idea of a kind of uh, dislocation of uh, time and of memory, which takes place especially after extremely disruptive events like say the Dresden bombing in that particular mm. instance but one could extrapolate yeah. the 20th century sort of uh, multiple uh, catastrophes of, of that era continuing into the 21st. Uh, so dreaming too perhaps becomes uh, more fraught as a result of that and perhaps that dissolution of the boundary between the story and the dream perhaps uh, sort of it becomes more accentuated again as a result of these sort of catastrophic events. Well, so my question would be, uh, did you find that uh, you needed to moor your sort of own sort of poetic persona or the construction of self in the poem you were sort of writing in uh -huh. history, in, in the context of historical events unfolding up to this moment? Or was it sort of more subjective, well, uh, especially with reference to this whole idea of dislocated mm -hmm. time and the dissolution dream? Well, well, I deliberately, I mean, I started with this anecdote, which, mm -hmm. you know, as I say, it's something I heard once, and I'm probably already turning it into a story by, by changing some of the details. But, um, you know, the very fact that, okay, this is the Second World War, these mm -hmm. are American soldiers, they're on a troop ship, you know, but what are they doing? They're, they're reading these, these mysteries that are going off into this completely imaginary uh, space. Um, and, you know, obviously that could have been extrapolated in, in multiple ways. I mean, you know, I imagine that a, a, a text like this, if I had wanted to, I could have kept going for, you know, and, and drawn in other things. But, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's selective, which I thought was a good idea. I, I, you know, because, yeah, I mean, Again, I mean, the, the idea of the, the story and the dream, I mean, yeah, the, it does erupt, I mean, I think. And, and, you know, and that's where you get religious breakthroughs and, and revelations and prophecies and, uh, and then manias and, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, where the dream life is spilling over, you know, and, and, and the li that line shifts and... Well, I think it happens all the time, actually. I mean, you know, uh, it's, um, I mean, the illusion that it doesn't happen is sort of the comfortable illusion of living in an ordered civilization uh, or society um, when, in fact, you know, it's constantly being breached. Definitely, uh, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to say really that the, the opening part of the story, the description of the soldiers reading page by page, I think that's the best description of reading, the love of reading I've ever heard. <laughs> it reminds me of the hours of boredom as a child mm. that you just devour things. And it also reminds me of the um, almost the grief you experience when you finish a book like mm. that. Um, mm. So much so that you almost want to go back to the beginning and unread it, you know, as if you didn't know. Um, and I suppose I was just wondering about you know, the question about how do we know it's a story? I mean, is it, is it in fact that we know it's a story when it comes to an end, in the, in the way that we know it's a dream when we wake up? Um, well, that, exactly, that yeah. sudden yeah. sense of a gap when the, when the story ends, you know, when you've been following this and then it's, okay, it's over, and, and there really is this chasm that opens at me, which may be just a momentary thing, or it may be a more profound thing depending on what kind of an experience you're having but uh and weirdly something that can happen again with the most trivial thing i mean it's not a question i think of you know how deeply you're being stirred by some profoundly expressive literary work i mean you you could simply be raptly absorbed in in you know one of one of these novels um 
I mean, not to knock these novels, but you know, mm. uh, you know, my experience, uh, you know, with uh, having read many of these books when I was researching my first book, you know, is that I enjoyed them all, and then I yeah. forgot them all. That's you know, right. I mean, I would look at the list of books I had read, and say, "Oh, I read that. Okay, you know." Uh, I mean, leaving not a trace behind, That's but right. but completely absorbing in in the moment. You know, um, it's a great image because I mean, on the one hand, I mean, there is uh, you know this mass quality. You're tearing the page, and hundreds of people are reading it at once. But once the story and the book exhausts itself, it's actually reduced to fragments. I mean, you can't even mm -hmm. reconstruct it, and in a in that sense, it's a, it's a very, very, as, as Tiffany was saying, a very powerful description of actually literally how a mass, uh, a bestseller works. Uh, you know, lots of people read it together, and for them, stagnant time begins to move. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, it sets into motion uh, time, and and but inbuilt within that is its own exhaustion and uh, because it leaves nothing behind. I mean, the book itself sort of is reduced to. You know, fragments of unrelated pages, which, in some senses, is the, it suggests an opposite uh, to the category that uh, Amit invoked in the morning, the Sinek Doki. Mm, uh, these are fragments now without reference. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, yes, I, there's a. It, it goes back to what you were saying about where we started this morning and the idea of um, stories as being humanly universal um, in some way because um, listening to that the, your, your poem about stories one of the things that came to me was that you were approaching stories in a wonderfully kind of encyclopedic way you, know, you, were, you were listing out all the different things that stories can be about or all the different denouements they can have this sort of this endless capacity for variation and, 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 and repetition that, that stories have. But it also seemed to me as well in the way in which you were evoking certain settings for this activity, like the, the truth mm. on the ship, or the, our ancestors in a cave. Yeah, well, I didn't well, want to make it too abstract. The, 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 question is that, uh, the question about this is whether, we, whether stories are important to us in the way they are because we are creatures who find ourselves with time on our hands. I, mean, I don't know, you know, whether it's a distinctive human burden or not, a species burden that we have, that we find ourselves with time on our hands, and therefore we need to contrive ways of passing the time. And one of the ways in which we contrive to pass the time is to tell stories. Or that I, I, I just felt that was coming through. What well, I think that must be the case. I mean, from, from so many things. I mean, I remember reading an account of... Uh, uh, one of the, by one of the Americans who'd been held hostage in in, in Tehran, you know, uh, for for uh, a long, long stretch, you know, just describing how by the time they were out of there, each one of them had recounted their whole life story, the details of every sexual encounter they'd ever had, and then the plot of every movie they'd ever seen, every television episode they could remember, anything to just stave off this, you know, sense of just total stasis and, you know. I had a question which is sort of related to what <coughs> Tiffany was asking, mm. um, which is that how do you know where to end? Um, because if you're dreaming, you wake up. If you're mm. living, you die. But when I was hearing your poem, I started getting this exhilarating feeling that it doesn't really need to stop anywhere. Well, that's a good story. Feel, <laughs> you can feel that sometimes with the John Ashbery poem as well, that there isn't, there are no, it's not a story. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, Ashbery, actually, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I find so extraordinary about Ashbery is that he, he, he doesn't acknowledge an end. I mean, uh, he he continues. Uh, you know, flow chart. I mean, it 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 flows on. It doesn't come to a, a finale. I mean, that that that's not a. And you know, the stories. It, it, no, it's a strange thing because stories, on the one hand, 
are supposed to have endings and people are disappointed if they don't have some sort of ending or, or some resolution. But at the same time, there's always the possibility of a sequel and a continuation. And now, especially nowadays, I mean, every story that is popular automatically generates an infinite series of, of sequels. So theoretically, it just goes on as long as people want to hear it. I mean, which, you know, likewise, I mean, that's also an ancient tendency. So, I mean, that hasn't really... It's not, not a new thing, but, um, but you know, the, the story can thereby, yeah, defeat death because it can continue the story. The events in the story can continue uh, uh, in whatever domain, you know, uh, they, they take place in. So thank you.